Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to Entrepreneurial Leadership with Joel Peterson and Samantha Daywall. My name is Colin Mahan, and I'm a program manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. If this is your first time joining us and you don't know much about us, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. As you may have seen in the chat, the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, along with our partner Mentor Cloud, launched a free mentor matching platform for entrepreneurs called Mentor Makers. Create your own advisory board to guide and inspire you with in the moment mentorship from topic experts and professionals dedicated to providing exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. Find or become a mentor today by using the link in the chat. Mentorship matters to all entrepreneurs. Their success is dependent on it. Quick housekeeping item for our webinar this, uh, this morning and afternoon. We'll open up for live Q&A at the end of the event, so please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. We'll try to get to all of them. Uh, again, none of what we do here could be possible without all the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, and NZTE. We are humbled by their contributions. Now, before we get started during these still unique times, we're curious on how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs we work with. So we're gonna start by taking a poll to let us know how you're feeling about your business right now. So I'm gonna launch this. Appreciate your participation in advance. The first question lets us know just how you're doing. We've been measuring this since the beginning of the pandemic and understand that many of these feelings are understandable. Also, what's keeping you up at night? This helps us understand the topics that you're looking to learn more about for our responsive programming. So thank you in advance for participating in that. I'm gonna let that run a little bit longer, but I don't want to delay the discussion. So thank you. And it looks like we've got a decent amount. I'm gonna give this another 10 seconds or so. Thank you guys for your responses. All right. I'm gonna end this poll and share these results. Optimism is at the top of the key, but totally understood that surviving, fearful and anxious are still there. And hopefully our discussion today will help some of those feelings. Um, also marketing is at the top of the key for what's keeping you up at night. Um, we have a ton of programs coming up around that arena. So stay tuned and we're going to get started in just a moment. Um, so without any further delay, Please join me in giving a warm welcome in the chat or by applauding um, our host, Dr. Samantha Daywalt, the managing partner of Lehigh at NASDAQ Center, and our special guest, Joel Peterson, author of Entrepreneurial Leadership. Sam, Joel, welcome and over to you. Good to be here. All right, thank you, Colin, and hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here as well. And Joel, I've so been looking forward to this conversation. So shall we get started? Sure. All right, so Joel, you have a very unique path that has many lessons our founders can learn from. So can you share a bit about the journey that has led you to where you are today? Sure, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody, but it is it is a tortuous path. I was born in a Quonset hut in the middle of Iowa, and by age 11, I'd started my first business. Uh, and then I worked minimum wage jobs to put myself through college and uh, Harvard Business School, uh, at which at time I took a job in France. I was called back to the United States to become the treasurer of a company that was out of cash. And uh, then the chief financial officer left. And by age 29, I was the chief financial officer of the largest private real estate development company in the world. And I worked on... Uh, turnarounds for a couple of years. Uh, I spent about 18 years there, finally became the managing partner. It all ended in conflict and I ended up having to start over at, uh, in my mid forties. And I started to teach at Stanford University uh, to buy companies. Uh, I bought about 250 companies. Um, they've done some 2,500 real estate projects. I became the chairman at JetBlue and have served on on roughly 30 boards. So it's been a long uh, marathon, uh, lots of twists and turns, but an interesting story. 
Well, it sounds like certainly the journey that has prepared you to be the expert on entrepreneurial leadership, which is what we're here to talk about today. So, Joel, what, um, why do you believe in today's business world and the world at large that we urgently need the type of leader you define in entrepreneurial leadership? Well, everything is uh, dynamic. Everything is changing. Uh, there's scarcity, uncertainty. Uh, entrepreneurs tend to be innovative, flexible. Uh, they're good at doing cost-benefit analysis, at assessing risks, at uh, figuring out probabilities. You know, as Norman Cousins, who, who was the editor of the Saturday Review, said, wisdom is the ability to predict results. And I think entrepreneurs have a certain kind of wisdom. I've expanded the notion of what an entrepreneurial leader is to include, you know, ability to be a manager, an administrator, a politician, um, you know, some of these other uh, kinds of things, a presider, that uh, are all important. And no, they're not found in any one person, but entrepreneurial leaders tend to have that ability to assemble a team and uh, create great results. Excellent. So Joel, in, in your book, you talk about the hallmarks of an entrepreneurial leader. So what are those hallmarks and why do you believe that any entrepreneur or business leader can build the skills and the mindset to become one? Well, so I, I really talk about four peers or pillars that have to be done. And I think anybody can learn those. The first, uh, none of them is easy, however. The first though is becoming trustworthy, being trusted, building a high trust culture. Trust is the currency of these flexible, innovative enterprises and of great entrepreneurial leaders. The second thing is to have clarity around a mission, to have clear goals, to have everybody climbing the same peak. The third is to make sure that you've got the right team. Getting the best team on the field is a really important thing. And once you've done those three things, then you're ready to execute. And execution has a bunch of checklists, all of which you can learn. You can get better uh, by using maps. You know, I learned uh, when I was chairman at JetBlue, I would sit in the cockpit with the pilots and even 25, 30 year pilots would go over a checklist every time. Uh, they probably knew it by heart, but this checklist led them to make sure that everything was perfect. And I think the same thing is true of starting and nurturing and turning around and managing businesses, the very things that entrepreneurs need to do. So that's really why I tried to put together a whole series of maps that I thought would be helpful to entrepreneurs. Excellent. Well, we're certainly going to dive deeper into those maps. But, but first, in your book, you shared a personal story about your wife, Diana's near tragedy in 2016, which became a metaphor for life. You said, we send our students and young entrepreneurs into the business world with a general sense of needed provisions, but little practical advice and very few complete maps. So given your background and experience as an educator and a business leader, and myself as an educator, I'm curious to, to hear your perspective, what opportunities do you see for education to better prepare entrepreneurial leaders? Is this something that can be taught? Actually, it can be taught. And a lot of it relates to this idea of these checklists. Uh, I think a lot of times academics present entrepreneurship at a very 30,000 foot level. Uh, but it's really at the granularity. You know, it's holding a difficult conversation, properly onboarding a new employee, uh, firing people so that you make sure that you have the best team on the field. I mean, it's a bunch of very granular things. So while we give them these big broad maps, we often don't drill down to the, to the uh, tactical steps. You know, who does what, when, where, how, how do you follow up, how do you measure it, et cetera. I think those are skills that can all be learned. Absolutely. And, and the importance of providing that space to, to put it into practice. You know, that's something that we're certainly passionate about here at the Billy Hyatt NASDAQ Center. So let's dive a little bit deeper then into the foundational qualities of an entrepreneurial leader. So the first one that you discuss is, is trust. So why does securing others trust begin with assessing your own core values? Well, so I, I would invite all the listeners to think about their core values. My guess is they would say things like integrity, honesty, hard work, et cetera. I would really uh, encourage them to say, what, where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your money? Where does your mind go when it's free? Time, money, and mind share are an expression of your true values. 
you may have these other virtues that you wish were your values, and they may sometimes be your values, but really time, money, and mind share tells it all. And if you're not living consistently with those, if what you say and what you do aren't the same thing, people can't trust you. So I think it really starts out with figuring out what are my core values and then announcing them and living clearly uh, within their, those boundaries. And that way people can trust you. They, in fact, what, you're empowering them because they can predict what you'll do. They know you're, where you spend your time, money and mind share so well that they're free to make decisions. They know you'd support. And so actually trust becomes the currency of an organization that can be flexible and innovative. So I think it really is a very important thing and it does start with your own core values. So you you mentioned integrity and, and that's a core value that you emphasize in your book and, and it's a word that can have multiple meanings. So how do you define integrity in terms of entrepreneurial leaders? Well, I think a lot of people think about integrity as honesty. I, I want people to th start thinking about it as sort of structural integrity. One thing leads to another. You can't be of two minds. And it really does get down to this idea of people being able to predict what you'll do. If there's a gap between what you say and what you do, people will become mistrustful. And wherever there's mistrust, there's leakage, there are delays, there's conflict and whatever. So the closer you can get to having this kind of structural integrity in your life, that means there's no gap between what you do in your personal life Life, what you do in your professional life, what your values are in various uh, places in your life. Once people see that about you, trust levels start to go way up in an organization. Yeah, I love that. That's uh, the hallmark of an authentic leader as well. So speaks to speaks to my heart. Um, so along with developing your core values, you state that becoming an entrepreneurial leader requires you to rewrite your operating system. So could you offer an example, perhaps from your own career or colleagues from JetBlue, Asurion, or another company to illustrate this step of rewriting your operating system? So I'll actually tell you my own story, uh, even though it's a little bit embarrassing. Uh, I really realized that I had some attitudes and some ways of going about things that were getting in my way. I was my own worst enemy. I was sort of self-centered, uh, emotional, and blaming. Those were characteristics that I don't know whether I inherited them or, or I just grew up under the pressure that made me behave in ways like that. But I developed um, three mantras where I said, you know, uh, I'm going to repeat these every day until I've actually rewritten that operating system. So the first one for me was, it's not about me. You know, it's about the mission. It's not about me. I'm not the center of the universe. The second one was, I am not my emotions. In other words, there I can think my way through things. I can assess cost benefit. I can make decisions that aren't uh, dependent on my emotions. And then the third one was, I have all I need. Um, so I don't need to blame anybody. I don't need to look for scapegoats that when I don't get things done on time or the right way or whatever, I have all I need. And those three things, it took me years and years of saying those mantras over and over to myself whenever I'd run into something. And I was actually able to kind of rewrite my operating system. I'm a better listener today. I'm more empathetic. I, um, I'm more flexible. I don't blame others. Um, so there, there's a lot of good things that have come from that in my own uh, in my own life. <laughs> so, Joel, you talk a lot in, in your book about the importance of protecting your your personal life. So, you and your wife Diana will be married fifty years next year, which is exciting. Congratulations! You have seven kids and, and twenty nine grandkids. And um, so, can you tell us why it is crucial for entrepreneurial leaders to both establish their personal brand and also protect their personal life? Yeah, so they're related. I, I, we can talk a little bit more, more about developing a personal brand. I think there's a process to go through with that. But really, you're only as strong as your home base. You know, if you have a solid home base where you feel loved and protected and safe, uh, you behave much better professionally and under pressure. Uh, you don't blow up. You don't lose your cool. You don't storm out of meetings. All the bad behaviors that you see don't really generally happen when people have this safe place that they can go to. So to me, protecting that uh, family life or that personal life or however you define it, people define it differently in their, 
in their own lives, but however they protect that is really important because it will spill over. We're not two people at once, you know, we're, we are integrated, we are one. And so we can try to hide the part that others aren't seeing, but my experience is make it really strong and you'll find that it'll spill over into your professional life. Excellent, excellent advice. So um, any advice on the personal brand building side of things? Yeah, so this is one where I think, uh, you know, I've had some really great experiences in uh, developing a personal brand and helping students develop their own personal brand. And I usually ask by saying, why don't you pick the five words that you would like to be known by? And uh, people will think about those and write them down. And then you come back a day or two later and said, did you really mean driven or did you mean stubborn? Stubborn? Or did you mean energetic? Or what did that word really mean to you? And by refining it, they actually come up with a brand that is consistent. I actually learned to do that when a daughter of mine was applying to college. We, we had one of the best talks we'd ever had for a couple of hours talking about the five words that were her brand. We did the same thing at JetBlue. And, uh, and there we had people debate you know, what were, what were these five words and which one was most important? And you won't be surprised to know that safety became the number one brand attribute that we wanted. Um, and usually what that means in a business context is then you have to be, you have to have behave consistently with that brand attribute. So that meant in the case of safety, having a board committee a meeting, allocating capital to it, having people that worked on it all the time. Uh, so you, the, building a brand isn't just thinking you'd like to be something. It's really saying, I'm going to devote some energy and these are the five most important things. Excellent. So you also talk about the work of creating a strong mission. So how can the practice of creating a mission statement help an entrepreneurial leader find and reinforce meaning in their work? And would you share some guidelines of creating a mission statement that's actually effective? Yeah, so I, I actually list some examples in the book of good mission statements and bad mission statements. I think there's a lot of risk with a bad mission statement. You know, we've all seen these ones that are um, hung on the wall in the boardroom and that people roll their eyes because they claim virtues and they claim things that aren't true. I think you're much better off having a simple, straightforward mission statement that everybody says, wow, that is true. A jet blue for example, we talked about bringing humanity back to air travel. So it was clear we were about air travel. It was clear we were customer focused. It was clear that we were going to be generous and thoughtful with our customers, bring humanity back. So we operated in a marketplace where a lot of customers felt abused. So that became our mission statement. And then we reinforced it with a bunch of other things, um, events. Um, so those are a couple of examples, Sam. Great. So we have this excellent mission statement now, but but then you have to build alignment. So how do you go about building alignment to your mission statement? And how about when you're doing sort of fundamental, you know, practical aspects of work like timetables and budgets? Yeah. Well, so alignment all uh, ultimately does boil down to uh, timetables, budgets, deliverables, etc. But I actually learned from Marvin Bauer, who is the uh, the founder of McKinsey, managing partner of McKinsey. He was also a Jones Day lawyer, brilliant guy. He wrote a book called The Will to Manage. It was fundamentally about this notion of alignment. And while I've changed some of the words, I really talk about aligning one's values with one's objective, with the strategy, which is the what are we going to do, the tactics, how are we gonna do it? Who's gonna do it by when? And then the controls, what do we measure? And if you can get all five of those values, objectives, strategy, tactics, and controls, all five of those in alignment, what you'll find is a company will nearly run itself. If everybody understands it and they, and they are aligned with that mission, it's really powerful. In fact, when we talked about maps, to me, that's the most important map that I've ever discovered and developed in my 50 years of running businesses. It really is, uh, energizes companies. Yeah, that's a, an excellent framework. So in your book, you stress the importance of building alignment or excuse me, um, the importance of building teams, right? Like building a really strong team. So why do you place priority on hiring people, people for values consistency 
over professional experience or technical competencies? Yeah, so values are the hardest thing to change and they really are hard work, transparency, honesty, uh, the best idea wins, you know, a lot of things. Whereas if, if you hire just for technical expertise, you may find that you have political people, people that aren't typically transparent, they aren't very uh, energetic, whatever. So I just find that the values are the hardest thing to change. Most people you can uh, develop uh, technical competence and or you can keep looking until you find somebody that has both. Uh, Trammell Crow, the guy that I first went to work for, said that we hire for brains and heart and we'll give them experience. So that became kind of the mantra that I used to hire people is hire for brains and heart. Yeah, love that, the, the EI side of the equation. So what are some of the common mistakes that leaders make in the process of recruiting and hiring talent? And how can an entrepreneurial leader avoid these mistakes? Well, you identified the first one when people just are looking for skills and they ignore these other things that will ultimately undo them. But um, I think uh, hiring for money, you know, uh, either paying, you know, thinking pay is at the center of the hire. It's important, but it really people don't work for money. They work for meaning, they work for being part of a team, they work for a lot of other things. So I think you want people who work well uh, with others um, you want people with track records. My experience is that uh, people who've won a bunch of times uh, don't like to lose and they figure out ways to go through walls and figure things out. Uh, so I, I look for a track record and I, I look to go back in life. I do reference checks. Uh, I do the reference checks myself. I don't think that's something that you can delegate. Uh, it's typically the confidential and the second and third order reference checks that reveal the most. And then I think onboarding people. I think if you can do a trial period, sometimes you can give somebody a project, which gives you a real sense in working with them. Um, but uh, I think get, getting permission to give feedback along the way, you know, getting the door open. When you ask, if you first ask somebody, would you mind if I gave you feedback in the moment? They'll always say yes. They wouldn't mind, but they'll always agree to it. And um, my experience is if you can get those feedback loops set up early, you can avoid a lot of problems that if you let it fester for a while. In fact, I have one entrepreneur who says that her experience with people is, I love you, I love you, I love you, now get out of here. <laughs> she gets frustrated and then she doesn't deal with it in the moment. So I think that's a common mistake. <laughs> that's great. Well, you know, speaking of mistakes, what do you see as some of the greatest challenges that entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurial leaders face, excuse me, in their quest to deliver results? Results is something that you, you talk about in the book. So what are some common challenges faced? Well, you, you have to deliver results. I think profitable growth is what everybody is seeking to deliver. So if you really break everything out, there's a hundred things you can deliver, but oh, Ultimately, it boils down to profitable growth. And I think you can lose track of some of the other things, the hows of how you get there. I've always said that I think the values I solve for are profits, growth, and respect. Uh, I've always said that, you know, people want to be um, respected members of a winning team doing something meaningful. And if you have, if you can solve for all three of those, you'll have avoided most of the mistakes. But it really takes a lot of thought, you know, that while well, that's a simple phrase, it's really hard to think about, you know, well, what, what how, do you, how do you show respect for people? It usually means a lot of listening. Um, you know, what is winning? That means getting your mission clear and getting everybody agreed to it. And something meaningful, you know, you really then have to hire for that. People have to come on, uh, on the or into the organization believing in its mission. And, um, and then they don't leave. You know, if they really believe that what we're doing is important, uh, they won't leave unless they have a bad boss. Yeah, absolutely. So Joel, it's been um, a unique year as, as Colin shared earlier. So would you offer some specific insights to help entrepreneurial leaders drive change and manage change and lead in times of crisis and adversity? Well, so I think one of the most important things is to be optimistic. You know, it's interesting that that was the number one thing that when people took the poll this morning, they were optimistic. Now they were fearful, concerned, anxious, worried, 
you know, they felt all those things too. That I've spent my life uh, in all of those camps, but I've remained optimistic. And I think it's hard to be an entrepreneurial leader unless you're optimistic. So you have to see a way to the, to the end. I think uh, winners get better under adversity. You know, what I've always said is in bad times, the strongest get stronger and the weakest get weaker. So you have to just say, how can we become the stronger? How can we be winners out of this? How can we thrive? And I think you have to imagine uh, winning. Say, what would it look like if things worked uh, really well? And that often means reimagining your business. And I would say, go back to those core values and say, are they still valid? Would we tweak any of those? You know, I gave the example of JetBlue where safety was our value. Well, as we rethought that, we said, you know, safety now includes health. So it used to just include flying around and getting people safely from one city to another. But all of a sudden it meant masks, it meant taking temperatures, it meant blocking the middle seat, it meant all kinds of things to make sure that we were safe. And so I think reimagining things. So I think adversity, while we all dread it and none of us would choose it, I think if you'll think back and think back on your life, uh, you'll say that I learned the most under conditions of uncertainty. And I wouldn't want to go through life without having had that experience. I wouldn't choose it again, but I'm glad I had it. Absolutely. And a lot of innovation has certainly happened over the last year and in, in times of uncertainty. So that's that's great advice. So let's get personal for a minute. What do you see as some of your own strongest leadership qualities and what have been some of your greatest leadership challenges? Yeah, so personally, I would say that uh, I'm an entrepreneur who is not the kind of entrepreneur that can go into the garage and create something new from whole cloth. There are those kinds of entrepreneurs and I admire them and I back them. I'm the kind who can take something that is not quite consistent with the market. I can go in and fix things. I can tweak things. I can get the capital structure right. I can get the marketing plan right. I can hire the right team. So I think I have the entrepreneurial skills that take something and make it better, but not the ones that start something from scratch. And I, I admire those. I'm also not that great as uh, an administrator. You know, some people, I think lawyers are particularly good at checking all the boxes and making sure that we're compliant with everything. I'm terrible at that. Uh, so I've listed these five kinds of leaders. Uh, I'm actually pretty good at the politics of it. I understand power, how to reward people, how to keep people from doing things. So there's certain uh, of these kinds of uh, leaders where I actually have the skill set to be good at, and there are others where I don't. So, um, and I'm actually a pretty good presider too, which is sort of the, where values are vouchsafed, where you give speeches, where you make sure that we all stay on course. But in terms of managing processes, administrating policy, things like that, I am terrible. And so what I've learned over time is that I need to make sure that I hire those people so that our team has all five tools to be an entrepreneurial leadership team. Excellent. So Joel, what is your ultimate goal for entrepreneurial leadership? Are you talking about for the book or the notion or? Yes, <laughs> perhaps both. Well, you know, I actually think we need more entrepreneurial leaders. I started out writing about this because I was so frustrated with politicians. I saw them as fundamentally innumerate lawyers fighting over words and without much vision or sense of how things folded, uh, how cost benefit unfolded in the real world, in the real marketplace. So I saw so much leakage in, in that system that I said, well, wait a minute, are their skills important? Yes, they are important. Political skills are really important in building a company and in running a large company, but they are inadequate. And so I said, actually, I love working with people who are innovative, flexible. You throw up a problem and they figure out a way around it. Uh, there's no moat too wide or deep that they can't figure out how to get across it. And then I started thinking about, well, what are the other areas? Well, presiders, I've known several people who are just wonderful uh, in embodiments of culture. And they're, they're people, uh, you may remember Lee Iacocca at Chrysler, kind of saved Chrysler because he was this very much out there 
uh, CEO that was speaking to, to folks. So presiding is one of the skill set. So I, I thought, you know, I'm going to try to define this new term, the the entrepreneurial leader to include all of the skill sets necessary to create durable change. So how do you create an organization that is durable, that is beyond just a profitable business, but is really a durable organization? I think that's derivative of having entrepreneurial leaders. Right. So we know that entrepreneurial environments are, are very ambiguous. So how does an entrepreneurial leader lead through ambiguity? Well, I think that's the job. And uh, I think it does come down to this notion uh, that I described that Norman Cousins said about the wisdom being the ability to predict outcomes. I think the entrepreneurial leader is always thinking outcomes. You know, how is this movie likely to end? And then allocating resources so the benefits exceed the costs and the probability of success is greater than uh, the probability of failure. So there's this constant calculation that's going on. And I think some people are instinctively good at it. Other people get better at it as they see more and more movies. Uh, so with 50 years behind me and some failures and some successes, I actually feel like most movies are not new to me. I've seen all the plot lines and I can kind of uh, make a pretty good judgment about what's going to work out. And I think entrepreneurial leaders tend to have that ability as much as any other ability. <laughs> oh. So going back to this notion of building trust within a team, how important do you think vulnerability plays a role in building trust in a team? That's a great question, Sam. And I actually think that a lot of leaders feel like can't, they can't be vulnerable. They can't show weaknesses. My experience is the opposite. The more transparent you are, the more disclosive you are, the more you're willing to change. You know, if you've made a mistake, say, you know what, here's what I'm working on. I think I made a mistake. We need to change course. This idea that the best idea wins is a really important one. And you can't always have the best idea. So I think being open, transparent, listening well, uh, you can't be always following, following all over yourself to appear humble. It has to be a, a true humility, the kind of humility that says, I'm a constant learner. I'm hungry for uh, facts and connections, and I'm always gonna learn, and I'm always gonna try to figure out what's the best next move, uh, not justify my past moves. I think all of that comes together in into creating trust and better decisions. Right, so it's okay to be, be a human, and in fact, that creates connection, right, and builds builds trust in teams. Absolutely. Yeah. So how is entrepreneurial leadership different in corporate environments and what tools can you apply when making this shift across? So I actually think it also exists in corporate environments. In fact, one of the examples I use in the book is of Alan Mulally. Alan was the uh, COO at Boeing, which is a huge company. And then he became the CEO at Ford Motor Company. Alan is an entrepreneurial leader. He has basically all five skills. He's a visionary. He has clear values. People trust him. Uh, he was able to create this durable sense of predictability that uh, Ford would deliver on promises. They were the only auto company that didn't have to go to the government for a bailout in the 2009 uh, cratering of the whole financial system. So Alan, to me, is a very entrepreneurial leader. He just happens to have lived his life at the top of major corporations. So I think you can find these same skills. And I think they really work there every bit as well. Absolutely. That's something we really try to instill in our, our students is that you can be an entrepreneurial leader, have an entrepreneurial mindset, regardless of context. If you're in a, a small startup environment, a, a large corporation, even if you're an artist or an activist, the, the ability to be an entrepreneurial leader, I think, is, is still there. Um, so, Joel, back to this idea of, of building, you know, a, a team that um, has alignment in, in values and in, in mission. How do you find those people? How do you find the best people who will share your vision and mission? Yeah, it's uh, a great question. And it's one of the most important ones you do. I've always said, you know, if you can assemble the right capital, if you can assemble the right people, and if you can assemble customers who are loyal to you, you've got a success. So the people part of it is really important. And my experience is that the best people will often find you. 
If you've been open about your values, if you've been transparent, if, you're, if you've lived consistently with them, if you are attracting capital and customers, uh, great people want to work where they can be respected members of a winning team doing something meaningful. And so uh, now that's a, a bit of a glib answer because uh, they don't always find you. I think you have to be out there. I, I find that a lot of times great people in the company uh, know other great people. And so there's a lot of uh, referencing that comes from within the company. Your first hires are your most important hires. I would spend a lot of time on getting the right initial team together because everything will flow from that. Um, I think also removing people who are not great is another way to find great people. Um, if you allow somebody who is dead wood to remain, uh, it actually um, hurts everybody within the organization. And it means that other great people won't come from the outside. So I think continuously culling the team and making sure you've got the best team on the field at all times tends to attract other great people. People love to be part of something. And so I think you have to create that. Uh, sometimes in early stage organizations, you can't afford to have the best people. I think I, I've always said, you know, come with us and help create something really great. We can't pay you what you're worth today, but come on board and, uh, and help us build it. And so many times you're able to get wonderful people that you wouldn't otherwise be able to afford. That's wonderful. So Joel, at the core of the center's mission is, is mentorship. So how has mentorship played a role in your entrepreneurial leadership journey? It's been incredibly valuable. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to have a direct mentor uh, in Trammell Crow. I, uh, you know, he, he sat right across from me and I could watch everything he did all day long. And, um, and it was a fantastic experience, but you, have the ability to have mentors who don't realize they're your mentors. You can observe people. So I think, I think everybody should find a mentor. And by the way, if you can't find a flesh and blood mentor, uh, get one out of literature or uh, history or whatever, right? Winston Churchill, uh, who saw the world through a very tough time, was an enormously flawed human being, but he was amazing at leading through adversity. And so I've used Churchill, never met him obviously, uh, but I've read virtually every Churchill biography because I've considered him a mentor. And then I think once you've been mentored in your own life, you have a duty to, to be a mentor, whether a direct one or an indirect one, whether people are just observing what you do uh, and, you, and therefore acting consistently with what you say, you actually become a mentor. Absolutely. We, we believe strongly in, in paying it forward here at the center. So that's excellent. So we do have a, a question from the audience in the chat. Um, so do diverse entrepreneurs, people of color and women face unique entrepreneurial leadership challenges as founders? And what are they? Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I've actually found um, entrepreneurial leadership abilities pretty evenly spread uh, between genders, among races, ethnicities, backgrounds, etc. Sometimes they have to be awakened because people haven't had uh, the notion that there's somebody that they can follow. I, it's interesting when I watch my students, many times people from uh, those kinds of backgrounds feel like they need to see somebody in that role before they really know what to do. So I think overcoming some of the, the reticence, but in terms of sort of the natural wiring, I mean, if you really think about what's important, it's important to be transparent. It's important to build trust. It's important to have clarity around your mission. It's important to assemble a great team, which means properly onboarding, advancing, and terminating people. I mean, those are skills that can be learned, and they're certainly not limited uh, by any of the, the things that you described. So I think a lot of it is a self-imposed uh, limit and just say, wait a minute, I can do all this stuff. Okay. And we certainly know by the research that diversity and leadership leadership teams brings greater value to the organization, to the customers. So there's certainly a lot of, of value in that. So Joel, one of the, the quotes that um, I read from you that just really resonated with me is success is the legacy you leave. It's the traces that you leave for good and the lives of others. So 
one day when you look back at your own life, what, uh, you know, beyond your role as a successful entrepreneur, would you like people to remember you for? Well, uh, this may not be what you want to hear, but I would say that uh, my kids and the kids that they are bringing in, I, mean, I, 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 uh, I actually wrote up an aligned plan for raising a family. And I said, I want to solve for menches, for maturity, for old souls. I'm not raising children. I'm raising great human beings. And so I organized everything around six measures that were emotional maturity, physical maturity, skill set maturity, spiritual maturity, intellectual maturity, et cetera. And then I operationalized those. I said, how would you, how would you end up with a child that is wise and kind and gracious and wonderful in every way? And tried to give them those experiences growing up. And so I didn't get hung up on being you know, a policeman. I was more a cheerleader and tried to expose them to experience. So I had a plan for that. And I would, I would most love to be remembered for the human beings whose close association with me has made a difference in their lives and in the lives of, of others. I think within the companies, that same thing is true. I told a group of students at Vanderbilt uh, last week or two weeks ago that uh, they had chosen to become leader managers and that that was one of the more noble professions that they might think that being a doctor or a social justice warrior or a teacher or whatever are the really noble professions. And I said, you know, if you really think about creating jobs, giving people dignity, you know, giving them meaning in their lives, that's a really important and a very hard thing to do to have judgment. So I congratulated them on, on that. And I got notes from several of them that said, I hadn't really thought that that's what I was doing. So I, I feel the same way. I feel like I've created tens of thousands of jobs and, um, and I'm really proud of yeah. that. I love that. And I love your first answer too. In fact, I think that was my favorite chapter in your book. So that was a, an excellent answer. So Joel, this has been a wonderful conversation and I'd um, love to invite our audience now to share their questions in the Q&A um, function at the bottom of their chat box. Um, so our first question that has come in from our audience is you talked about your mantras, one of which involved not being so emotional. How do you separate emotions from passion? Yeah, so I think passion is a certain kind of emotion. I think it still falls in the, in the category of emotion. It tends to be a more positive one. It tends to drive people to do things. But I think I, what I always say is I separate out what are emotion, these feelings that well up from my instincts. My instincts are developed over years of feelings, emotions, coupled with analysis. So I'm able to predict outcomes. So I'm a big believer in listening to my instincts, but not allowing my emotions to rule. One of the ways that I've made that happen is I'll sleep on things. I'll often make a decision and say, okay, we're gonna go left and I'll go to sleep on it. And in the morning I'll wake up and I said, actually, we need to go right. Uh, because something happens in the middle of the night. You know, these things kind of percolate through your mind and everything comes together and you just say, you know, my instinct tells me we should do this. Even though I want to do this other, my emotion says one thing, my instinct was a combination of emotion and analysis tells me another, I go with my instinct. That's great advice. So Joel, could you elaborate on the difference between strategies, tactics, and controls? Yeah. So. Uh, Let's say that your objective is to climb a certain peak, you know, uh, that you've picked, you've all decided there's a whole mountain range out there in front of us and we're gonna, we're gonna all climb this peak. Our strategy is gonna be, uh, you know, what, which peak are we gonna climb? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna assemble? You know, who all is gonna be on the, on the trek? And, and so you say that the strategy is to take this certain route. The tactics are, <clears throat> you know, how, how are we actually going to execute it? Who's going to bring the, the ropes? Who's going to have the first aid kit? How, what are we going to do for food? You know, it's all of the details of the hows. So the what is the peak, 
the hows are who's going to do what, when, how, and what do we do on a daily basis. It's the granular plan. And then the controls are at the end of it, every day, we say, how did we do today? We wanted to get a mile and a half in. Uh, how did we do? Well, we only got three quarters of a mile. Okay, how do we catch that up? Or somebody fell behind or somebody broke their leg or whatever. We measure these things. Do we still have a, a functioning team? So those are the three things to me that are the, the really powerful execution steps. Um, and so I think getting really good at those, differentiating between them, learning how to measure them is a really important element uh, and a huge part of the map for success. That's excellent. Thank you. So another audience Q&A, what do you think are the most important skills for you in your career and for the people you led and how did you learn from them? So I, 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 I guess I started out by saying I can learn from anyone and everyone. And uh, I think developing listening skills. I was interviewed by Adam Bryant for the New York Times in one of these court, corner office things for an hour and a half, for 90 minutes. And at the end, he entitled the, his article, Listening with No Agenda. And uh, I thought that's an amazing thing after 90 minutes of talking about everything under the sun, that's what he said. And I think he really captured what I had learned is that I really had learned to be a, a great listener. And that means probing, asking questions, giving contrasts, absorbing, you know, so that the party with whom I'm speaking says, actually, he understands that better than I do now. Mm -hmm. I think that's when, when somebody really feels listened to. I don't know how many of you have had this experience, but you know, most of the time when you talk, you don't feel like anybody's really listened. They're just preparing their next comment, you know? And uh, I actually think if you ever get around a really good listener, uh, you trust them, you like them, you're willing to do things with them. So I think my ability to lead others has been that people have felt like I've been empathetic, I've understood, I wanted to honor them, to show them respect. Not that I'm afraid to make a decision other than that. In fact, usually I'll make a decision that doesn't, isn't consistent with what a lot of people think, but they trust me and they're willing to follow it. So I think that's probably the, the, and it doesn't sound like a hard skill. You know, people talk about, you know, programming, engineering, you know, all these hard skills. I actually think the ability to connect with other human beings, to have them trust you, to be empathetic, to listen, et cetera, in a leadership function is really powerful. Yeah, so, so important. So what do you think are the best things early stage founders should spend time on? Well, uh, I've already mentioned assembling the right team. I think getting the right partners, the right people in the right seats is about as important as anything. But I think there's an equation that says, what is the problem I'm solving? What is the market need? What are customers hungering for that they don't have? How can I fill a need? I've always told great salespeople that the best ones are the ones that solve problems. They're really great listeners. They're not pushing product they're delivering product into a need. So I think figuring out what that market need is and then understanding how do we provide something where the benefits to the consumer are greater than the cost to me to provide that uh, service or good and getting that equation right. So they say, wow, I've, re I've really got, I'm delivering a lot of value and I'm doing it at a price that I can afford to make a good, uh, a good business out of it. I think figuring that equation, getting the right people in place. And then I would say aligning, aligning values, objectives, strategy, tactics, and controls so that the enterprise can feel energetic and running itself. So you don't have all this leakage. You know, a lot of big organizations, there's so much leakage, you know, in energy from getting all the way through the alignment. That's excellent feedback. So speaking of feedback, you talk a lot about the importance of feedback in your book. And, and one of our questions is, is direct feedback always in private? Well, it depends on the feedback. I think uh, sometimes you can give feedback to a team or you can give feedback to a whole company saying, you know, we're falling down in this, that or the other way. It's not specific, but I, I always ask people if I can give them feedback. I always give more feedback than uh is typically set up officially. You know, a lot of people have these uh, year-end reviews. 
That's not the time to give feedback. I actually think the feedback, the most valuable feedback is given in the moment. But I've always found that you have to ask people for permission to do that. May I give you some feedback? Uh, because it can be sensitive. And I think just asking the question shows respect. And people will always say yes, or almost always say yes. And then I think you do it in private and just say, you know, th th here's something. I want you to think about improving how you do this. Did you notice when you said this that Shelly went into a, into a, into a shell, <laughs> that she became very quiet? Uh, you might think about why that happened. You know, did you notice this, that, or the other? Here's something to think about. You know, and you're coaching. There's a, a real power in coaching, and coaching is largely feedback. It's giving people data. So I think these control systems that are measuring things are one form of feedback that can be gen done generally and publicly and is really good to do. I think one-on-one -on -one private feedback that's very regular uh, and in the moment is the best way to lead your intimate team. Yeah, feedback is a gift, but there's certainly an art in the way to, to deliver feedback. So what are your thoughts on having a co-founder? Is it necessary? It's not necessary. It's often quite helpful. It's lonely being a founder, it's also dangerous having a co-founder. Um, you know, you have to really feel comfortable that you're both on the same wavelength. And I always say, uh, develop the off-ramp for each of you before you get into it. In other words, say, if we have a disagreement or we can't say, here's what we're going to do and have a way to do that where somebody's gonna be uh, the arbiter, uh, there, there's a formula for buying one out, there's a system, because in a lot of cases they don't work. I've had, I would guess about half of the entrepreneurs that I work with and back end up with founders that just don't work out over time and for good reasons. And they're both great people and they both go on to do great things. The other half of the time, it actually makes each of them better than they would otherwise be. But you have to be complimentary. You know, a lot of times people want a founder who's just like them. It's in fact, it's so much more comfortable. But when I told you about my strengths and weaknesses, the worst thing for me would be to get somebody who wasn't good either at administration and the management of the daily rhythm of things. It would be, we would end up in conflict and things wouldn't get done and it wouldn't work. So, but it's hard to go out and say, I, I want to hire somebody who has a skill set that's so different from mine. Usually what that means is I don't really feel that comfortable with them. So this idea of selecting for complementarity is a discipline that's really important in the founder equation. Yeah. And you share a really great story in your book of a, of a co-founder team that, that you backed that you know didn't work out in the end, but they ended up being both very successful. So uh, it was a powerful story. So could you share um, a little bit more about how you managed spending time with family along with handling all of the responsibilities of, of work life? Yeah, so part of it goes back to this plan I had, you know, there's something about writing down. So we said, you know, I want all my kids to, for example, one of the things we decided was we thought uh, visiting the Normandy beaches was an important thing to do when kids were teenagers. And since we had kids that spanned 18 years, we ended up taking three trips back to these Normandy beaches, it became a tradition. And we walked through the bunkers and the craters and the, the American cemetery there and, and whatever. But uh, I think scheduling things out and having a plan. We had a 12 month plan and we would calendar events. And then I always got up at four in the morning. I just found that, uh, you know, when kids are getting ready for school and rushing around, I, there's no quality time there for me. Uh, and so I'd go into the office at four. And I got in four hours that were like freebie. It felt like I was cheating. I got in a whole day's worth of work before anybody showed up. And then I could be home by dinner. And dinner was a time, you know, when there was homework, there was what went on during the day, et cetera. And then I tried, at least on the weekends, I tried to coach kids' games. I tried to drive them to concerts or whatever. I just There's something about having a child in a car that's captive. You know, and I wouldn't allow the radio to be on. Uh, it was just talk time with dad. So I think you have little rules and disciplines. We, we used to take all of our kids out on uh, any child's birthday uh, to dinner. And uh, we would say, here's what I love about Sarah. 
and I would tell some story that I loved about Sarah. And then we'd go around the table and everybody would say, here's what I really loved about Sarah. And by the end, Sarah's just beaming, you know, and the, all the kids are realizing, hey, I really do love this sibling. And so it's, it's creating these quality moments and thinking about them ahead of time. This idea of being intentional is the way that you do it. And I think, I think we all have a lot of time that we waste. If you really go through your day and think about how much time is wasted, it's a lot. And so I think squeezing some of that out and that reallocating it is a, is a good way to do yeah. it. Lo love that. Be, be intentional. So Joel, to close us out here, what is the one thing you want entrepreneurs to reflect on as they leave this session today? So uh, I would say that the natural skill that has drawn you to become an entrepreneur, to have this interest is something the world needs. You know, your ability to assess situations, to predict outcomes, to make trade-offs under conditions of uncertainty. You know, you're trading one thing against another and it's not certain what's going to happen and you have the courage to do that. That is an extraordinarily valuable skill. You didn't just inherit it. You may have had proclivities, but you've learned how to do it. And I think doing that as your life's work is really important and passing it on to others uh, is a gift. So I encourage all of you and uh, thank you so much for the, for the time. It's amazing. Joel, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to our community today, share your incredible insights, personal stories, and just such a great overview. So thank you. And on behalf of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and everyone in attendance today, we're sincerely grateful for you joining us. So Colin, I believe that's back over to you to close us out. Thank you so much, Sam and Joel, for the incredible discussion. Hope everyone found tons of value in that because I know I did. Um, as mentioned, marketing is one of your top needs that's keeping you up at night. So next week, we hope you can join us for, on Tuesday, The Best Brands Are Brave, The Power of Storytelling with Beth Doan. Um, and also on April 15th, for those of you who are looking to learn a little bit more about the venture finance trends in the ecosystem across the U.S., we've got um, an event with Wilson Sincini and special guests to talk about just that. Um, we really appreciate all of you who give us feedback. So please take a moment to take the survey that has been dropped in the chat. And we all look forward to seeing you all online very soon. Thanks again, everybody, and see you online.